It is now my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Barry Chandran. He was the Chief Administrative Officer of Canton Fitzgerald, one of the world's largest leading financial services firms. He was responsible for overseeing and directing the day-to-day -day operations and administrative processes across the Capital Markets Group. Schronburn was on the 78th floor of Tower One when the first plane hit on September 11, 2001. He helped a colleague suffering third-degree burns to safety and was thrown into a national spotlight thereafter. His miraculous first-hand account about survival has been retold in newspapers, magazines, broadcast outlets, and books. As the author of Miracles and Fate on 78, he draws from the personal heartbreak he endured during the devastation of 9-11. A native New Yorker, Schramburn is passionate about philanthropy and serves as a board member of Strength to Strength, a global nonprofit organization that works with victims of terror across the world. Before Eric comes up to speak, we have to show a short video. Due to the nature of this subject matter, please be advised that this video is graphic. I've been in love with the city of New York probably since I can remember. When I was a little boy in Brooklyn, my parents would take me to Manhattan. I've always found the skyline of New York City a beautiful expression in a very dramatic way of what America is all about. I think the World Trade Center is one of the stronger, bolder symbols of American freedom, and particularly economic freedom. And I like the impact that it had on the New York City skyline. I'd photographed it myself many times. And a couple of times, this was long before I was mayor, I'd actually go out in traffic, which would be a little dangerous. Cars would go around me so that I could just get the exact shot of the World Trade Center. September 11 uh, was supposed to be a fairly quiet day for me. It was a beautiful day. something that has happened here at the World Trade Center. We noticed flame and an awful lot of smoke from one of the towers of the World Trade Center. My heavens, this is just, just smoke happened. Smoke is within pouring time. out. This gas goes from one side of the building practically all the way to the other. We had seen a fireball, and I can tell you it appears tower number two, at least from our vantage point, appears to be unaffected. This appears to be entirely in tower number one. told that apparently a plane had hit um, the World Trade Center. And we started driving down Fifth Avenue toward the World Trade Center. We are now looking at flames shooting out of the north side of uh, number one World Trade Center, but there are at least some windows uh, blown out and still. Holy shit. Here is another plane oh, just flew into. No, there isn't And then all of a sudden, I saw a big explosion of fire. And at that point, we all concluded, obviously, it was, it was, a, ter it was a terrorist attack. I think that was the first point at which I realized that we were into something different than any, any of us had ever prepared for, or any of us had ever thought we would live through. I realized I was in some kind of a horrible, awful,
horrific human experience. We have a large crowd here, babies. A lot of babies. You don't see people jumping from the windows like this. And you can actually see bodies falling from the top floors of the World Trade Center. It's horrible here. People are standing in the street in tears. People are panicking. They're calling their families. A mother described to me talking to her son on the telephone when the second plane hit. And that's the last time she talked to him. Another family described to me how their loved one had let two elevators go because he was older and the people in the elevator were younger. And somehow my, my, my mind went back to the stories and the things you read about the Titanic or you know, people who allowed other people to get on, get on boats and they didn't get on the boat because they were older. And from that moment on, I started thinking that we'll never know all the heroes. We know our uniform people were heroes. They went there and they died and they gave up their lives bravely trying to save the lives of other people. But what we don't know are all the individual stories of the person who gave up the elevator for another person, the person who calmed someone and got them out of the building, the person who organized their floor so that everybody could evacuate, the person who maybe at the last, in the last moments uh, comforted people when all of them knew they were going to die. It is fine. Get there, run. Oh, tower just came down. Oh, shit. The entire building appeared to have collapsed. The tower appeared to crumble and start to fall. I don't know if it did. It down. I didn't look anymore after that. I turned and I started to run. Everyone ran. People just took off. People ducked into doorways and people didn't stop to look behind. I felt to be so sick that I couldn't breathe at all. I tried. It's really hard to talk. I still can hardly see. There's so much smoke in here. This was an attack intended to destroy us because we are a country that's built on principles of freedom. And because of free will, people get a chance to distinguish themselves. This wonderful American civilization emerges, which isn't based on any ethnic group. It isn't based on any one race. It isn't based on any one religion. It's based on people believing in freedom. situation right now the situation is that two airplanes have attacked apparently what all right well then let's get let's go, let's go north then My name is Ari Schoenbrunn, and on September 11th of 2001, I worked for a company by the name of Cantor Fitzgerald. We occupied the top five floors of Tower 1 of the World Trade Center, floors 101 to 105. We employed 960 people. On that day, 658 of my friends and coworkers were brutally murdered simply because they were sitting at their desks. There was no other reason. They never did anything to anybody. They never hurt anybody. All they did was go to work the same way that they did every single day. And on that day, they didn't come home. Four employees were on the upper floors on their way up to their offices. Three of them were so severely burned, they spent months and months in hospitals undergoing surgeries and rehabilitation. And one of them walked out without a scratch and you're looking at that person. 9-11 was an absolutely beautiful, gorgeous, perfect fall day. You saw it in the video. It was just a perfect day. It was 20 to 7 in the morning. 
I had my briefcase over my shoulder, I had my cup of coffee in my hands, and I yelled up to my wife, bye, hun, love you, see ya. I yelled up to my kids, bye, kids, have a great day in school, and I started to walk out the door. And all of a sudden, a voice comes down from the second floor of my home, and my wife yells down to me, did you do Baruch's book order? Now, I learned something very important that day. Teachers have a wonderful way of torturing parents. It's called the Scholastic Book Order. <laughs> I guess some of you are familiar with this. Well, my son was no different than any other eight-year-old, and maybe a little bit more whiny than some, but he was a difficult child, and my wife, who was a school principal, who had just opened school the week before, who was getting ready for the high holidays because the you know, Rosh Hashanah was the following week, she didn't want to be bothered with it. She couldn't deal with it, and she said, uh, it's your job to do the book order with him. I said, okay, I'll take care of it. Yeah, right. Did you do the book order? I said, no, I didn't. She goes, you're not leaving the house until you do the book order. I'm a good Jewish husband. I listened to my wife. I put my briefcase down, put my cup of coffee down, walked into my kitchen, proceeded to negotiate with my eight-year-old for the next 20 minutes. I whittled him down to two books. I felt pretty good. Interestingly enough, the two books that he picked were from a series called Survivor. When those books showed up, like a couple of weeks later, I looked up and said, God, you've got a great sense of humor. Thank you very little. <laughs> so I filled out the tear sheet, filled out the check, put it into his knapsack. Oh, very important, before I go on, that book order was actually due on Monday. But my son left his pamphlet in school on Friday. So my wife wrote a note to the teacher asking her if, she can if he can have an extra day. She said, sure. She made sure to put the pamphlet into his knapsack and bring it home. Had my son brought that book order home on Friday, I would have done it with him on Sunday. He would have brought it into school on Monday, and on Tuesday, I would have been sitting at my desk at 8 o'clock in the morning, and somebody else would be standing here telling you a different story because I'd be dead. But because he left that pamphlet in school on Friday, I am here today to tell you my story. That slide that you see, that was a note that my wife wrote to the teacher thanking her for giving him the extra day because that is what saved my life. You're going to see, by the way, a whole bunch of coincidences that happened during the course of the day that is basically why I'm standing here today. So I put the tear sheet into his knapsack with the check, pick up my briefcase, pick up my cold cup of coffee, and out the door I go. And I am seething. I am so angry at my wife you can't imagine. Because that 20 minutes cost me 40. The later you go, the, later, the longer it takes you to get in. I didn't get to the Trade Center until 20 minutes to 9. Man, was I ticked at my wife. Of course, I was loving her that night at 11.30, but that's a different story. So my office was on the 101st floor. Magnificent view. It was, it was incredible. So in order to get up to the 101st floor, you had to take an express elevator to 78. 78 was a sky lobby. And then you would switch in the sky lobby for the elevators that would take you up to the higher floors. Now, there were about 11 or 10, 11, or 12 of these large elevators in the lobby. And I was standing down waiting for the first elevator to come that would take me up to 78. It turns out that, that elevator was all the way on the right side of the lobby. So I went running down to the end of the lobby, get into the elevator. And these things were huge. They, they held like 50 people. And they were the fastest elevators in the United States. There was one elevator that was smack in the middle that went from the, from the lobby all the way up to Windows in the World, which was the 106th floor, and it did it in like under a minute. Your ears used to pop when you took that elevator. It was amazing. So I run down to the end of the lobby, get into the elevator. We get up to the 78th floor. I get out, and of course, the elevator I need to get to my office, to my floor, was all the way on the left side of the sky lobby. Now, the only thing in the sky lobby were like elevators, escalators, and there was one desk in the middle where the security guard used to sit. So I get off, 
I make a left and I start walking down towards the bank of elevators that I need in order to get up to my office. I must have been about eight feet from that bank of elevators when as best as I can describe, there was an explosion. I thought a bomb had gone off in the elevator. The lights went out, the place filled with smoke, and I was literally thrown off my feet. I was on the floor. And there was screaming, and yet there was somebody yelling, fire in the elevator. And I'm thinking, sure there's a fire in the elevator. A bomb just went off in there. I didn't know. I'm on the ground, I'm looking around, I don't know where to go. All of a sudden I see a light in between two banks of the large elevators. I figured that's an emergency light, it's probably a good place to go. But there was a lot of smoke. And I remember we learned as a kid, what do you do when there's a lot of smoke? You stay low to the ground, right? I literally crawled from where I was to that bank of elevators. And I got up and I'm looking around, I don't know where to go, I don't know what to do. I walk behind the bank of elevators and I see a door there. I open the door, it was a security office. Now I had been working in that building for eight years, never knew there was an office on that floor. I never saw it, the only thing I saw was the security guard in the middle. I open the door, I walk in and sitting on the ground with her back to the wall is this woman's security guard and she is crying her eyes out. And I leaned over to her and I said to her, ma'am, calm down, we're gonna be okay, we're gonna get out of here. And she calmed down a little bit and then I walked further in and I saw the guy who was the fire warden for the floor. Just as a point of reference or a point of information, every floor in the Trade Center, I'm assuming in every large building, they always had one guy on every single floor who was dubbed the quote unquote fire warden. He was the go-to guy that if, if there were ever a situation, a problem, an issue, management would be able to get him directly, he would be able to call on a special phone down to management and they would take care of whatever it was. Now I knew he was the fire warden because he wore this silly red hat and it said fire warden on it. I knew that because I had the same hat because I was the fire warden for my floor. So I went running over there, I go, where do we go? What do we do? He looks at me and goes, I don't know. Of course he didn't know. We had no idea what had happened. All we knew was that a bomb had gone off in the elevator. I go back outside trying to figure out a way to get out and I bump into a coworker of mine. Her name was Virginia DiChiara. Virginia was on the elevator that I just, that I, um, that I was about to get on when the plane hit. The slide you see is an artist's rendition of what that elevator looked like. See what happened was, as she explained it to me, when the plane hit, the, um, the doors of the elevator started to close and they jammed open about a foot. The walls of the elevator collapsed, the ceiling collapsed. There was a cable in the elevator that, that snapped and was sparking in the elevator. The jet fuel came down the sides of the elevator, ignited by the spark, and there was a wall of fire. There were three people in that elevator. There was Roy Bell, there was Virginia, and there was Renee. Roy Bell was the first one to jump through that fire, and he suffered second degree burns. Virginia jumped out right after him, and she suffered third degree burns. And Renee, who was the last one out, she died from her burns. All in a space of six, eight, 10 seconds, that's all it was. That was the difference between life and death that day, at least for these three people. And Virginia looks at me, she says to me, Ari, please help me, whatever you do, please don't leave me. I'm in so much pain. I said to Virginia, I promise I will not leave you and we will get out of here. Now here's a bit of irony, Virginia and I, we're not good friends. She was an internal auditor. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> she had been hired by Canner a year before. First department she audited was mine. What does she want to do? She wants to impress her superiors, right? Guess who got a lousy report? Guess who was almost fired because of it? And there we were. And I, I tell you, to this day, I'm thinking to myself, I could have just said, you know, to heck with you, lady. Ran, try to get out and, you know, but here was another human being in trouble. I was the guy that was there and I was gonna do whatever it took to help her. Our past did not matter. She was in trouble, I was there. And I said, Virginia, I will take care of you. We will get out of here, don't worry. 
Oh, sorry. I'm not used to these clicker things, but. So I brought her into the office, sat her down, gave her a cup of water. She was like really, really thirsty. And I turned to the uh, fire ward, what do we go? We, you know, where are we going? What are we doing? He says, I don't know yet. He was trying the landlines. The landlines were totally knocked out when the plane hit. The, uh, the cell phones were, were not working. There was no signal anywhere. All of a sudden, another, another woman security guy comes walking in and she's carrying a two-way walkie-talkie radio. And I'm thinking to myself, there's help at the other end of that radio. But she's crying like a baby. I ran over to her, I grabbed her, I said, ma'am, you got a radio, you can get us help, you need to calm down, you need to get on that radio, and you need to get us help now. And she kind of like snapped out of it, and she was like whimpering, and she's going like, we're on 78, we, we need help. There was so much chatter on that radio, I realized help was not coming from there. Look at the, look at the uh, fire warden back and forth. Finally, he turns around and he says, okay, we can get out, stairwell on the left. Stairwell on the left, I'll never forget those words. You know, when I walk into buildings these days, whether tall or short or whatever, I always look around for these little signs. You know what they say? They say exit. I look for those because I never know when it might save my life because it certainly did that day. We walked out. I looked up, sure enough, there was an exit sign, walked around a bend, some guy ran ahead of me, there was a door there, he opens the door, and sure enough, there was a stairwell. Guy says, I found it, and I'm thinking, great. I look inside the stairwell, and I see there are lights on. So I figured that's probably um, emergency lights, and I turned around, there were people, there were about, it was myself, Roy Bell, Virginia, the fire warden, and there were about six or eight other people, security guards and the like, on the floor. So I turned around to the people on the floor and I said, does anybody have a flashlight? Thinking to myself, if those lights go out, this is an internal staircase, it'll be pitch black. And two people raise and go, yeah, we got flashlights. And I'll never forget thinking to myself, where did you get a flashlight from and why are you carrying it? <laughs> are you like waiting for Monty Hall to show up and offer you $100 for a flashlight? I mean, really? But I didn't care. I said, folks, listen, if the lights go out, nobody panic. We will have light. And the next thing I did was I looked down at Virginia's feet. And I said, thank God she's wearing flats. Because let me tell you something, there were high-heeled shoes in that stairwell all the way down. Women had kicked them off to get down as fast as they possibly could. So we got to the stairwell and we started to head down. It was the fire warden. Roy Bell, myself, and Virginia, we walked in a line. And the reason we did that was I turned to Virginia, I said, listen, as we're going down, if you feel faint, if you feel like you're going to fall, fall forward, fall on me, and I'll carry you. And Roy Bell turns to me and says to me, wait, 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 wait. If, you, if she falls on you, you fall on me, there's no way. I says, Roy, I got it handled. We got it. And we started to head down. We got down about... Three flights, that's right, the 75th floor. We got down to the 75th floor, and all of a sudden, one of the biggest miracles of the day happened to me, other than the fact that I wasn't killed when the plane hit, my cell phone rang. Now, most people look at me like I'm crazy, so what's the big deal? But the reality is, in the Trade Center, you never, ever got signal in the Trade Center. It just didn't happen. I remember standing, on my window, standing up by the window of my office going, hello, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Everybody, anybody ever remember that commercial? Can you hear me now? Yeah, they filmed it in my office, okay? <laughs> it was, my phone rang. I was so shocked. I picked, I went, hello? It was my wife on the other end of that phone. And she was crying and she was telling me something about a plane going into the building. I had no idea what she was talking about. I said to her, Joyce, listen, I'm in a stairwell. I'm on the 75th floor. I'm on my way down. Now is not a good time. I said, I'll call you when I get out of the building, and I hung up the phone, not realizing, of course, it would be hours until I was able to speak to her again. Roy Bell says to me, oh, my God, you got signal on your phone. Can I use your phone to call my wife? I said, of course. I handed him my phone. He dialed. He hit send. Nothing. Dead. I literally looked up, and I said, thank you, God, because at least I knew now that my wife knew that I was alive, which certainly gave me a lot of comfort. I'm sure it gave her some comfort, too, but... Oh, and by the way, oh, so as we were heading down, 
we got down to the 50th floor. And Virginia says to me, Ari, can't go on. Can't do it. My first instinct was, I'll have her sit down. We'll rest a little bit, give her something to drink, and then we'll get up and keep walking. And then I said to myself, you know what? If she sits down, she may never get up. And if she doesn't get up, she is going to die. And I don't know about you, but it wasn't on my agenda for the day. So I said to her, no, Virginia, you can do this. And there were a couple of people with us, and we were pouring uh, water. They had water bottles. The firefighters that were coming up, they were breaking open vending machines so people can get um, you know, water. And so we were pouring it on her arms to give us some relief from the burns and you know, giving her to drink. And now I'm coaching. Now I'm counting down the floor. I'm going like 45, 44, 40. You're doing great. You're doing great. And we were doing great until 38. 38 was backed up with people. See, the firefighters, as you see coming up, they stopped the people from going down. So there was a, a, a whole block here on the 38th floor. And I remember as we were going down, at, right before we got to this block of people, some woman heard us and she turned around, she saw Virginia and she went like, oh! Virginia looks at me, she says, Ari, how bad is it? I said, Virginia, you look great. <laughs> the reality is I needed to keep her spirits up. I couldn't help her medically, but I can keep her spirits up and that's what I tried to do. But I'm running scared. I mean, she is in really, really bad shape. That is what she looked like several months later. You can see the scarring on her arms and you don't see it on her legs, but it was. She was lucky actually because she put her hands over her face before she jumped through the fire so her face and the palms of her hand weren't burned. And that was, the doctor said that that's one of the things that actually saved her life because she didn't get burned in those two places. So. I'm looking around, I don't know what to do, we're, we're stopped, so I started to yell out. I said, is there a paramedic in the building? If you're a paramedic, please help us. I have a burn victim here, we need help. And if not, please step to the right and let us through. And they did. People squeezed over as much as possible in order to open a path so that we can continue going down. We got down to the eighth floor. There was water all over the place. And I'm talking ankle deep running water. See, the sprinklers worked very, very well on the lower floors where there was no fire. They were totally knocked out on the upper floors when the planes went in. And I remember, I'll tell you, I was wearing a brand new pair of pants that day. And I said, if anything happens to these pants, my wife is going to kill me. <laughs> uh, the fear that the Jewish husband has. <laughs> so I did this. <laughs> All right, that lasted exactly one flight. <laughs> and then I said, you know what? If I ever get out of here, I'll deal with my wife later. I told Virginia to take it real slow because if she would slip and fall, it would be game over. We went down, we got down to the first floor and the fire warden who's been leading us the whole time keeps going down. I said, where are you going? He says, we have to get out through the garage. I turned to Virginia. I said, we just went down 78 flights of stairs. What's another four or five? And we continued on down. We got down about two flights when all of a sudden the door on the first floor opens up and some guy yells out, where are you people going? I said, we're going out through the garage. He says, no, no, you can't get out through the garage. You got to come back up here through the first floor. I turned to Virginia, I said, we got to walk back up two flights. She said a few things that I can't say in mixed company or in any company, and we headed back up. Now, here's the interesting thing. I learned later there were people in that garage that never got out. Who was the guy who opened the door? I have no idea, because I never saw him. And why did he pick that moment to open the door? I have no idea. But that guy, whoever or whatever it was, saved our lives that day. We got out and I look around and I see we're in the lobby of, uh, of Tower Once. Where, this is where it all begins for me every single morning. I figure you go through the revolving doors, through the lobby, out the revolving doors, the fast way out of the building. But there were police and firefighters there and they're telling us, no, go the other way. Go through the mall, go through the atrium, go. 
It was a long walk, but you know what? I'm a good citizen. I listened to police and firefighters, and we went the way they told us to go, and boy, am I happy we did. Because had we gone out the way I wanted to go out, would have put us out on West Street. You know what was going on on West Street? That's where the people were jumping. I saw it on TV. We all saw it here just now. If I would have seen that live, I'd be locked away somewhere in some insane asylum. I never would have been, I never would have been normal again. So I thank God that they were there to take us and to show us the, a different way to go. We walk through the mall, through the atrium. We finally get out on Church Street. And there are cops and firefighters, and they're telling everybody uptown, uptown, everybody. The people are running uptown. I finally stopped the cop, and I said, excuse me, I have a burn victim here. Where do we go? What do we do? And he says, across the street in front of the Millennium Hotel. Bring her over there. There's a triage center. There'll be ambulances there. Bring her there. And that's what I did. Brought her across the street in front of the Millennium Hotel, and sure enough, an ambulance pulls up. And I help her into the ambulance, and I breathe a sigh of relief. Because finally, she's getting medical attention. Like I said before, I can only help her, you know, keep her spirits up, but I couldn't help her medically. So now she's getting medical attention. I step out of the ambulance, I turn around, I looked up the buildings, and there was a guy standing next to me, and I turned to him, I said to him, how did building two get on fire? And the guy looks at me like I'm crazy. He says, what, are you kidding me? Two jetliners went into the buildings, they're calling a terrorist attack. I look at him, I go like, what are you talking about? I had no idea. Remember, when, I, when my wife said to me about a, a plane going into the building, I thought it was maybe like a little cell, a Piper Cub, you know, one of those little planes that we always used to see flying underneath us. I had no idea. I am running really, really scared. All of a sudden, I realize that the ambulance isn't going anywhere. So I, I, I turned to uh, the ambulance driver. I said, why aren't you leaving? He goes, we can't leave until we fill the ambulance. They're expecting a huge amount of casualties. Unfortunately, there weren't that many casualties because you were either very, very much alive or very, very much dead, and there wasn't a whole lot in between. But they said, we have to fill the ambulance. Virginia, they wouldn't even let her lay down. She had to be sitting up. And she was writhing in pain. She was telling me, Ari, I can't. I said, Virginia, hold on. You're going to be OK. Finally, they fill the ambulance. The guy says, OK, we're ready to roll. <sighs> Great. Virginia turns to me. She says to me, Ari, you're coming with us. Now. I don't want to say I was in a comfort zone because of what was going on, but the reality is I knew where I was, and if I needed to get someplace else, I would know how to do that from where I was because I knew the area. The thought of getting into an ambulance and going with her to God knows where did not excite me. Besides, the reality is as soon as that ambulance leaves, there is only one place that I am going, and that is back into that building because I am looking for my friends and my coworkers, and I'm looking to help. I turned to Virginia. I said, Virginia, you don't need me anymore. I will get a hold of your mom. She will come to the hospital. You're going to be OK. She turns to the ambulance driver, and she says, we're not leaving unless he comes with us. I look at the ambulance driver. He looks at me. I see it in his eyes. He is thinking, this is not a cab service. I'm thinking, I don't need a cab. <laughs> but I finally look at him. I said, you know what? Maybe for our own psychological benefit, maybe I should come. And he says, hop into the front. And I got into the front of the ambulance, and we pulled away. We were one of only a few ambulances that actually got away from the scene that day. I have friends that are volunteers in a, in a, in a volunteer ambulance company. They showed me pictures of crushed ambulances at the scene. Virginia thanks me every day for saving her life. And I say, you got it all wrong. Who saved whose life? If she wouldn't have insisted that I get into that ambulance, I would have been standing at the base of that building when it came down, and I would be dead. There is no doubt in my mind. But because she insisted that I get into that ambulance, I am here today to tell you my story. We pulled away. We went to St. Vincent's Hospital. We got there, the emergency room. And let me tell you something, they were ready. The doctors, the nurses, the gurneys, the equipment, everything was there. You know what the problem was? Not a whole lot of people came. We brought her into the emergency room, and they start to work on her, and then all of a sudden, like, everybody disappears. It was the most amazing thing. So I, you know, she's writhing in pain. I walk out into the hall, I say, hello, hello, is there a doctor here? I got a burn victim, what's going on? Finally, a doctor comes, he goes, what's all the yelling, what's the matter? I said, you got a burn victim here. She's writhing in pain, and everybody disappears. He goes, who are you? I go, who am I? I said, I'm her coworker. I, I brought her in. And he says, you have to leave. Why? Because you're not a relative. Hospital protocol. 
We're under a terrorist attack and you're telling me about hospital protocol? Hello? They didn't care. They literally threw me out. I turned to Virginia, I said, Virginia, I'll get a hold of your mom and she's gonna be here soon and you're gonna be okay. And with that, I walked out. As I walk out of the hospital, I hear a voice behind me going, wow, did you hear? Tower two collapsed. And I'm looking from St. Vincent's Hospital, which was on 7th Avenue and 12th Street, you had a clear view straight down to the Trade Center, and sure enough, Tower 2 was gone. Gone. 50,000 square feet per floor times 110 stories, and this thing was gone. It took six years to build it. It took an hour for it to come down. I couldn't believe it. I had a pit in my stomach like you wouldn't believe. I don't know what to do. I'm trying to get a phone. I need a phone. So I, I figured, you know, the cell phones weren't working. I went like, I'll find a payphone. I start to ask people, does anybody know where a payphone is? A payphone. When was the last time anybody in this room used a payphone? Please raise your hand. Well, I was nuts, you know? I mean, it was just, I, I just, I wasn't thinking clearly. Whatever. All of a sudden, I see a guy walking down the street and he's talking on a cell phone. And I was thinking to myself, when this is all over, I'm going to find out who his carrier is and I'm going to switch to them. I ran over to the guy and I said, excuse me, can I use your phone? It's an emergency. He was on the phone. He says to me, uh, yeah, sure. He says, listen, some guy needs my phone. I'll call you back. And he hangs up the phone. He hands me the phone. I dialed. The first person I called was Virginia's mom. I told this to my wife six months later. <laughs> she was so mad. She goes like, why didn't you call me first? I said, I promised I'd call her mom. I said, hi, Ms. DiChiara, my name is Ari Schoenbrunn. I'm a co-worker of your daughter, Virginia. She is alive. She is severely burned. I recommend you get down here as quickly as possible. St. Vincent's Hospital. And all I heard was, ah, 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 And then finally, a man's voice comes on. I guess she handed the phone to her husband. And I told him the story. He thanked me, and I hung up the phone. I look at the guy, and I says, can I make one more call? Now, he heard the whole conversation. He says, of course. I dialed my wife. I hit send. Nothing. Dead. I went, <clears throat> Forget that carrier. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm running scared. All of a sudden, I see across the street, there's a, uh, a restaurant. I think a restaurant, they have phones. So I go running into the restaurant. I bump into the restaurant. I says, excuse me, can I use your phone? And he looks at me and he says to me, well, it's not my restaurant. It's not my phone. I'm thinking, what's wrong with you? I saw two people in the back on phones. I literally push, push past the, uh, the waiter, and I go running to the back. There's a woman standing there. I get to the back. She says, do you need a phone? I go, yeah. She goes, you're going to have to wait. Wait. I can't wait. You don't understand. This is an emergency. All of a sudden, there were two guys sitting there eating breakfast or lunch. I have no idea because I didn't know what time it was. By the way, the first time I looked at my watch, it was a quarter to one in the afternoon. The guy says to me, do you need a phone? My apartment is five doors down. You can come to my apartment and use my phone. Now, this is New York City. I'm thinking to myself, axe murderer? <laughs> but I'm desperate. And I go like, uh, yeah, thank you so much. And he says, listen, I'm going to let this guy use my phone in my apartment. You and I will catch up later. And he and I leave. We walk out of the, we walk out of the um, restaurant. And we literally walk around the corner. And we get to his apartment. And he opens the door to the apartment, and I, and I look inside, and believe me, I had closets that were bigger than this apartment, okay? I mean, his apartment was so small, you couldn't change your mind in his apartment. That's how small it was. It was unbelievable. But he had a phone, and I went like, okay, thank, you know? And so I started to dial. I called, and I get a fast busy, trouble on the line. Fast busy, trouble on the line. I'm going crazy. Finally, it starts to ring. My heart is pounding. Beno Space Yaakov, may I help you? That's the school that my wife works in. She's a principal in an all-girls uh, yeshiva. Um, I said, Joy Shomra, please. Who's calling? Her husband? Hold on. No, no, no. And then they put you on hold with the music to calm you down because they're never, ever coming back to talk to you. The reality is it couldn't have been more than 60 seconds. It seemed like hours, and all of a sudden, my wife gets on the phone. I say, hi, honey, it's me, and she starts to cry. I said, honey, what's the matter? Tower one had collapsed. The last time she spoke to me, where was I? I was on the 75th floor of Tower one. She was sure I was dead. 
She was wondering how she was going to tell my four kids that daddy is gone. My two girls were older. My two boys were younger. My wife was wondering who was going to say the mourner's prayer for daddy because my son, my oldest son, was only eight years old. Thank God. Thank God. I came out alive. And she calmed down and she says to me, Ari, you know, the entire city is shut down. No trains, no buses, nothing. You can't get in or out of the city. The tunnels, the bridges, everything is shut down. What are you going to do? It's like, thanks for the update, Zazu. Um, I, oh, I'm glad somebody got that one. <laughs> I said, I don't know. Maybe I'll go up to Ellie's office. Ellie was my brother. He worked on 47th Street and 6th Avenue. I said, maybe I'll go up there, but I'll call you when I get to my next destination. That was the hardest part of the day. We're so used to being in touch all the time that not being able to be in touch was really, really difficult. So I figured I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I, I said to John, oh, John Rocasalva, by the way, never ever forget that name. That was the guy whose apartment it was, all right? And I turned to John and I said, John, I'm a little tired. Do you mind if I rest a little bit? He goes, oh, sure, no problem. So my shoes and socks were still sobbing away from the trade center. So I took him off and he looks at me and goes, oh, your socks are all wet. Would you like a clean pair? You can have one of mine. Who's this guy from Texas? I mean, who was he? <laughs> the guy was an absolute saint. By the way, and I know I'm going to get some applause on this one. He was actually from Ohio. He was. So I said, uh, no, I'm good. I hung out there for about 15 minutes, realized I needed to get going, put my wet shoes and socks back on, thanked him, and I walked out the door. Um, now I got to get uptown. I don't know how to get uptown. I don't know where uptown is, right? So I started to ask people, anybody know how to get uptown? They look at me like I'm crazy. And they go, follow the crowd. Everybody's going uptown because sure as heck, nobody was going downtown, that's for sure. So we get up and I see it's 8th Avenue and uh, 12th Street. And I remember I had a friend of mine who had an office on 9th Avenue and 16th Street. But it wasn't just any type of office. This was a, he was a, um, a financial printer. So they had showers, they had workout rooms, billiard rooms. I mean, it was, this was a great office. My biggest problem was I didn't have a change of clothes, so showering wasn't going to help me any. So I went in there, and as I walked through the double doors, the, re the receptionist looks at me and she says to me, Ari, are you okay? Now, I had no idea what I looked like. By the way, John did not have a mirror in his apartment. He was a nice guy, but he was a little strange. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm good. She says, can I get you anything? I said, yeah, a conference room, a phone, and some water. That's all I need. I realized how thirsty I really was. So they were really nice. They gave me the conference room phone. I started to call everybody I knew to let them know that I was still alive. The only people I couldn't get a hold of that day were my parents. See, my parents lived in Israel, and you couldn't get a, an international line out for no money. But what I found out was I had a niece living in Belgium, and my niece from Belgium called my sister-in-law in West Hempstead, New York, and my sister-in-law West Hempstead told my niece in Belgium that I was alive, so my niece from Belgium called my parents and told them to let them know I was alive, so at least I knew they knew I was alive. Now, if you missed any part of that, see me later, but it's not important, because the only important thing is that I knew that my parents knew that I was alive, so that's what counted. So, um, all of a sudden, this guy walks into the conference room and he says to me, excuse me, would you like some lunch? I go, lunch? What time is it? Quarter to one. I said, thanks, I really, really appreciate it, but you know, I, I'm strictly kosher and you know, I, I appreciate it, but I don't think you can help me. He goes, oh, it's no problem. You know, we have kosher clients here all the time. I'll call the deli across town and I'll have them deliver. And well, they're not gonna deliver. Remember, the city was shut down. He goes, oh, sure, they deliver all the time. I'm thinking, you are clueless. I said, great, pastrami on rye, fries and a Coke. Knock yourself out. Guy comes back to me about two minutes later. He says, uh, they won't deliver. <laughs> well, duh. <laughs> he felt so bad for me. They had a pantry with some chip snacks and orange juice, and that's what I had for lunch. I called my brother. My brother says, come uptown. We'll figure out how to get out of here, and that's what I did. I called him up, and I got to... Uh, I got to his, we, I actually walked to 23rd Street and then there was another miracle that happened where a, actually a city bus pulled up and 
stopped like a half a block from where I was. I got on the bus and it literally took me all the way to 47th Street. So I got to my brother's office and I ring the bell and his office was on a lower level. And I ring the bell and I say, who's there? I said, it's Ari Sherman. I'm here to see Elliot. Just a moment, please. They buzz me in. I buzz and I walk in. And then I walk through another set of double doors. And about 20 feet from where I was standing, my brother was standing there. And I saw him. And I ran to him. I grabbed him. I hugged him. And I cried for five solid minutes. See, I had been really, really strong the, the entire day because I needed to be. It was survival. It was my survival, Virginia's survival. I needed to be strong. And now, finally, there was somebody that I could lean on. And he was my younger brother. And I just totally lost it. And I started to cry. And so, of course, he started to cry. And uh, it shouldn't surprise anybody, by the way, because the showmans are very, very big criers. We're, we're huge criers. With a drop of a hat, we cry. So it shouldn't come as a surprise. Anyway, so I said to my brother, what do you want to do? How do we get out of here? He says, I heard there's limited subway service. We actually went down. There was a subway that we were able to get. Took us out to Queens, where my mother-in-law was living. And I called a friend of mine who owned a car service. And she said, yeah, I'll send the car to pick you up. I knew it was going to be probably a half hour to an hour before the car comes because I saw the traffic and it was just, in, it was literally a standstill. It was like a parking lot. So I took out my phone and my phone was working. My brother took out his phone, called his wife, told her to meet us by my house. And I called my father, I called my parents uh, in Israel and I got through. And all of a sudden my dad picks up the phone. He goes, hello. I go, dad, it's me. It's Ari. And he started to cry. <laughs> Big wonder. I said, Dad, what's the matter? I'm alive. And by the way, I know that you know that I'm alive because I've been from Belgium called Rini in West Hampstead. And Rini said, I've been from Belgium, I was alive. And Rini, and I've been from Belgium called you to tell you I was alive. What's the matter? Didn't you believe her? He said to me, no. He said, I didn't believe anybody. He said, I wasn't going to sleep tonight until I heard your voice. Now, this was 11.30 at night, that, you know, his time. And I'm saying, boy, am I glad I didn't wait till I get home to make this call. <laughs> the car finally comes, picks us up, brings up to my house. I walk into my house at 5.30 in the afternoon. There are 20 people in my living room, and I have no less than 100 phone messages. I learned something very important that day. You have no idea how many friends you really have until they all think you're dead. I did learn a lot that day. You know, as I said to you earlier on, I worked in Wall Street, I worked for Canada Fitzgerald. There were guys in the office at 6.30 in the morning. And these guys were very, very wealthy. And they're here in the office at 6.30 in the morning. Why? The bigger house, the bigger boat, the bigger car, the nicer vacation, the next promotion. That's all they cared about. That's what life was all about. And I was guilty of the exact same thing until that day. My kids used to say to me, Daddy, can you come to the school play? I've got the lead role. No, Daddy's got to work. Daddy, can you come on a class trip? We're going to the zoo. Some of the other daddies will be there. You can be, right? No, Daddy's got to work. Daddy, can you come to mock trial? You know, that's after school, so that's after work. So you can be there, right? No, Daddy's got to work late. Daddy's got to work. Daddy's got to work. Daddy's got to work. That was always the refrain until that day. Today, Daddy's on the class trips. Daddy's in the school plays. Daddy is wherever his children and grandchildren now need him to be because that is what is important in life. But there's more to it than that. You know, I took a, I, I, I look back on my life and I realized I didn't like the person I was and I was going to change. I needed to change. And one of the biggest changes that I made in my life was the fact that I said, from now on, I will not curse. I will not swear no more four-letter words. And let me tell you something. When you work on Wall Street, that is a very difficult thing to do because these guys are worse than drunken sailors. Let me tell you. But you know what happened? Because I made that decision, I changed the people around me. Because any time there was a meeting that was either around my desk or in a conference room that I was involved in, nobody would swear. Nobody would curse. There wouldn't be a four-letter word yelled, other than maybe golf. Um, <laughs> well, you know why they call it golf, right? Because all the other four-letter words were taken. Um, <laughs> but nobody would curse. Nobody would swear. So look at what happened because I made a decision. 
Life is about decisions, okay? We live in a crazy world. We all know that. The, the world is upside down. We need to do something to make it better, but how do we do that? You know how you do that? You start with yourself. You start with the changes that you need to do. See, here's what I challenge you to do. Take one thing that you're, not going to, that, that you're going to change within you that's going to make you a better person. Write it down. Put it on an index card so you don't forget. Carry it with you so that you can always be reminded of it. Put a copy on your refrigerator so when you go to sleep at night, that's the last thing you're looking at, if you're like me, that you hit the fridge. And, and in the morning, it's the first thing you see. Do that. You know why? Because you've only got one life. Make it worth living. This is the second to do. If I can, if I can bother you now, okay? Right before, I've got one more story that I'm going to finish. But I'd like everybody to take out their cell phones. Can everybody please take out their cell phones? I know you never thought you'd hear a, uh, a speaker from stage saying, take out and turn on your cell phones. Take out and turn on your cell phones, okay? And text my name, Ari, to 21,000. Okay, everybody do that? Great. Now, you should have gotten back a URL. I want you to click on that URL. Once you do that, there'll be a very, very short little form that I'd like you to fill out. And when you fill it out, click Submit. Shouldn't take you that long, okay? And in a week's time, you're gonna get a free gift via email. It's going to be the history of the World Trade Center, 105 facts that you probably never knew. And I'll be sending that out to those that do this. I'll be sending that out via email. We got it? Okay, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, another a minute or two. Everybody needs it. Everybody having a good time, by the way? Because I know I am. <laughs> and thank you, Randy. Shout out. Shout out to Randy Ruder, by the way. You should really thank him. It's because I met him two years ago, and that's how long it took until I finally got on stage here. <laughs> but he's great. Okay. So. I'm going to end with a short story. It's about a farmer who had an old donkey. And the donkey was walking, uh, walking around in the, in the, on the farmer's land. And the farmer had an old well that was already dried up. And the donkey was walking. All of a sudden, the donkey fell into the well. And it started to bray, and it started to scream, whatever. And no matter what the farmer tried to do, he couldn't get the donkey out of the well. And so he decided, you know what? It's an old donkey. It's going to die soon anyway. You know, I can just, I can accomplish two things. If I just bury it here, I'll be closing up the well, which was a danger anyway, and I'll put the donkey out of its misery and everything will be fine. And he started to throw dirt into the well on top of the donkey. And all of a sudden, the donkey was, realized what was happening. He started to bray and shout and it was just uh, incredible noises and screams. And then all of a sudden, it stopped. And the farmer looks as he's throwing the dirt in, and he sees that the donkey is now, every time the dirt comes, shakes his head and takes a step up. And shakes his head and takes a step up. And this keeps happening until the entire well was filled up to the top, and the donkey walks out. Life is going to throw a lot of dirt on you. You know what life's all about? It's about the decisions that we make. It's not what happens, it's how we react to what happens. The donkey realized, this is a way for me to get out. So remember, life is decisions. Make the change that's going to make you better and make the change that's going to make the people around you better. And I'll tell you, life is going to be so much better. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>